Father, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for who you are. We thank you, God, that you are the God of the breakthrough. Father, I just lift this service. I lift your people before you, God. You know you know all things, God. Hallelujah. You know exactly. God, you know exactly what it is, God, they need. Father, I thank you right now in the name of Jesus, God, for ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. Oh, God, I pray right now in the strong and matchless name of Jesus, oh, God, that your word will come and break through, God, into their lives, God, to push them, God, into the next place, God, to push them, God, and God, even keep them stable, Father. We thank you for the power of your word because you declared, is not the word of God like a hammer that break the rock into pieces, Father. And is your word not like fire that comes, God, to burn away, Father, the things, oh, God, of this world and the things of this flesh, Lord. So we honor you. We give you preeminence, God. We give you praise. We invite you in. Even now in the name of Jesus, God, anoint this mouth to speak your word in your word only, Father. And we honor you. We praise you. We glorify you. God, we say that there is no other God that is quite like you. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. In Jesus' matchless name, in God's people say amen, 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 amen. So we are going to be coming from, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. 1 Samuel 24. We're going to read verses 1 through 12. We're not going to focus on 1 through 12 to do the line upon line, else we'll be here all night. And I would like to go home and eat. So, everybody got it? Okay. Almost? All right. And the word of the Lord declares, and it came to pass, when Saul was returned from following the Philistines, that it was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David, his men, upon the rocks of the wild goats. Mm. And he came into the sheep coats by the way where was the cave, and Saul went to cover his feet. And David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. And the men of David said unto him, Behold, the day which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privately. privately. And it came to pass afterwards that David's heart smote him. Say his heart. His heart. Because he had cut off Saul's skirt. And he said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth mine hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. So David said, stayed his servants with these words and suffered them not to rise against Saul. But Saul rose up out of the cave and went on his way. David also arose afterwards and went out of the cave and cried after Saul, saying, My Lord, the king. And Saul looked upon, looked behind him, and David stooped his face to the earth and bowed himself. And David said unto Saul, Wherefore hearest thou men's words, saying, Behold, David, seek thy hurt. Behold, this day thine eyes have seen now that, David, that the Lord hath delivered thee to the day into my hand in the cave. And some bade me to kill thee, but mine eye spared thee. Say, mine eye. Mine eye spared thee, and I said, I will not put forth my hand against, the, against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Moreover, my father, I see, yea, See the skirt of thy robe in my hand. For in that I cut off the skirt of thy robe and killed thee not. Know thou and see that there is neither evil nor transgression. Hallelujah. In my hand and I have not sinned against thee. Yet thou huntest my soul to take it. My God. And the Lord judge between me and thee. And the Lord avenged me of thee, but mine hand, say my hand, shall not be upon thee. Amen. As you take your seats today, we're going to be talking about the heart of honor. 
the heart of honor. Look at your neighbor and say, the heart of honor. And I am, before we're going to actually get all the way started, we are going to give honor where honor is due. We honor the senior leader of this house, who is Apostle Claven Leonard, in his absence. Amen. To overseer, our overseer, Pastor Lincoln Nelson, who is in Charlotte, North Carolina, and his lovely wife, First Lady Prophetess. We thank God for them, all you ministers, all you leaders, all you auxiliary leaders, all those who serve in the house of God. We thank God for you. Amen. Amen. So we are talking still about honor, and I find it uh, very interesting how God always sets up uh, the things for the month. Because when I go back, and last month we were talking about what? Okay, two whole people. <laughs> no, okay. So we were talking about deliverance, and there are different strategies that God uses to free his people, okay? There are different ways God does things, and there's a very common uh, churchy colloquialism or terminology that we talk about when we talk about breakthrough. Everybody knows about breakthrough, 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 but nobody considers what it really takes to get breakthrough. Because we always say God is the God of the breakthrough. He's going to do this for me. Yes, he does do it, but there are... Um, some ingredients he uses to whip this concoction up in order for it to work. Now, you guys know me. I'm a teacher at heart, so I'm going to give you fun facts before we even get all the way into the lesson, okay? So when we talk about the actual definition of honor, which we've gone through several times in this month, uh, when we go and look in the Hebrew text of honor, that word translates as kabod. Has anybody heard that word before? Okay. Only Sylvie? Oh, well, I, only, only you would know that, Dish. <laughs> okay, okay. So that word is kabod, kabod. And it is very common church term when we talk about the glory of God. So when we talk about kabod, when we go and look up the definition of kabod, it literally means weight. It means heaviness. For example, if anybody has ever said, oh, I was in the presence of the Lord, I fell, what did, what, what did they say? I, I was um, slain, that's the church term, slain in the presence of God. When you're just on the floor and every time you feel like you try to pick yourself up, it's like a load of bricks that's on your back. So when we talk about that glory, that is the weight that is synonymous with the term. It means weight. It means heaviness. Hence the term, I don't take it as a light thing. Let me put my weight on it. Let me put some weight on something. It makes, it signifies its importance. But it, what is so very interesting in the Hebrew language is that Hebrew language uses a lot of, um, what do you call that? Um, mm -hmm. It's almost, uh, I don't know who, who studies uh, Asian languages, the intonation. They use a lot of intonation. So it could be the same word, and if its tone is different, it means something completely different. What we call them and what a lot of the Greeks use in the Sepuchant, Sepuchant, which was the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Text Bible, they called them idioms, which means they put words to pictures of things that really did not equal actually what the words mean. So the thing is, is that when they actually did that, not only did it mean heavy, weighty, it also meant grievous. It also means hard or burdensome. Now, what is really, really interesting is how do you equate the word kabod, which is the weight of God, the strength of who he is, the glory, the burden, the hardship? How does all of these things come together? Well, we see them generally every day in our lives when we talk about I'm anointment. I'm anointed, I'm called, I'm this, I'm a prophet, I'm an apostle, I'm a pastor, I'm an evangelist. You get to see all of these things used interchangeably in the environments that you encounter and the pressure 
that God begins to apply to your life. Now, I don't know about y'all, but this week for me has been a week of pressure. This month, generally, I feel like since the, the coming in of February, the month has been a month of pressure. Now, scientifically, pressure is measured with liquids, gases, all of those things, and it's known as PSI. Now, PSI is weight over area, which means if you're in a closed or smaller space, the, less, um, the, the more pressure is applied to you if the weight is heavy and it's pushing out, which means you have less room to stretch out. If you can see it in your mind, it's like you can see a box, you can put a pound of pressure on a box, or you can put a pound of brush pressure on a, a bench. Which one would have more? It would be more pressure enclosed in spaces. Now, and some of us, we look at our lives and say, God, I feel like you're telling me you're elevating me. You're doing all of this. You're doing all of that. But naturally, it does not appear to be that way. Because he's closing in some areas of your life. Now, and I don't know about you guys, but for me, when God begins to close in areas, it means he gives me less options, less choices, a little bit less freedoms to do exactly what I feel. And feel is the key word here. Feel like doing because he understands that when the anointing is you're called to have an anointing on your life, there must be a level of pressure that is applied. Where can we see that, elders? You can see it in the Mount of Olives, where Jesus, right before he was crucified, he took him to the Mount of Olives. Why would he take him to the Mount of Olives? Because it was a pressure that he was feeling that was going to be applied right before the height of his elevation. And many of us, not just in this body, but in the body of Christ, we are feeling the pressure. Now, it doesn't mean that your life is breaking down. It doesn't mean you're going broke. It doesn't mean you're heartbroken. It doesn't mean any of those things, but it is an unseen weight. It is an unseen pressure. It is something that you feel, that you feel is weighing down on you. But what the Lord began to say to me, that even when it came to the kabod, which, again, means honor, it also means weight. At every level of elevation, there is another layer of pressure that is applied to you. Why? Why does God, and see, this is the big question that we all have, God. Why? Why do I feel this pressure? Why do I have to go through this? Why do I have to cry? Why do I have to be rejected? Why do I, why, why, why? God allows, remember this, God allows pressure to keep you in position. Because if you're anything like me, when you start feeling the pressure of transition, when you start feeling the pressure, hallelujah, I feel God right there. When you start feeling the pressure of elevation, when you feel, begin to feel God pull you from one place to the next, when God begins to pull you up, which means when he begins to pull you in places of spiritual height, those are places that the flesh cannot go. So he begins to allow your environment, your atmosphere to begin to squash the flesh. Squash and press and press because what he's looking for is the oil to come out of your life. And so this is why it is so important that we look at David. David is a key leader in the Old Testament. He was just the bomb.com. He was all of that. Morally, he had some hiccups. You know what I'm saying? Like he was like boning other people's wives and killing them and, you know, to make sure that it looked legit and, all, you know, all of that. However, he was still a great man of honor, which means he understood position. He understood that when God placed him in certain areas, in certain phases, in certain transitions, he knew how to get in a correct place. Okay? Everybody with me? So, now, as this translates from deliverance, which I want to give you another fun fact, there are Psalms. Can, can you get Psalms 107, 16 for me? This is a prayer. If anybody ever listened to Cindy Trim, um, a lot of people like to pray, uh, listen to her. Um, what's that thing? The, what do you call it? 
No, it's a prayer that she prays. It's like an hour-long prayer. But you'll hear her say this a lot. And people who work in deliverance say this a lot as well. It says, for he have broken the gates of brass and cut the iron bars asunder. Now, you'll hear people say, amen, the prophetess is calling me during church. Hallelujah. So (laughs) you'll hear him talk about breaking bars, brass, and iron. Now, does anybody, can anybody imagine how much pressure it takes to break iron or brass anybody know you know I'm going to tell you right so iron which is steel the pressure is weighed in PSI it says iron takes at minimum 40,000 pounds of pressure just to bend it just to bend not to break not to sever just to bend 50,000 pounds of pressure for brass. Now, these are used synonymously in deliverance because these represent the prison and bondages that the enemy has you in. He has you boxed in, built in, pretty much make sure that you're not going to get free. So when we talk about The weight or the kabod of God, it's a level of weight and pressure that is necessary for breakthrough. But we fight it because it puts us in the enclosed spaces. We don't like it. We don't like it. And another thing that we under have to understand that there's many strategies of this warfare of how God breaks us free. God uses the pressure. He allows the pressure to squash the flesh. And if you can imagine, as he applies the weight of who he is, the weight of who he is, it begins to break, break the bars of uh, of brass and iron. Even if you think about the voice of the Lord, if anybody remembers in Psalms, it said the voice of the Lord, it goes to the forest and it breaks the cedars of Lebanon which means his voice is so powerful that in the trees it begins to break them apart. They cannot withstand the pressure of his voice. So we put all of this, and we're going to wrap all of this into David when we go back to 1 Samuel 24, 1 through 12, because by the time we get through here, David has gone through a lot. Now, what's very interesting that I found about David and Saul's relationship, it started off in love, right? And, you know, as we've been studying honor, we've been doing it in a relational context, how to love God, how to honor each other, right? So it's something about their relationship. They started off in love. In 1 Samuel 16, 21, it says David came in. This is when he used to play before him. And he said he stood before the king, and the king loved him and made him his armor bearer, which we hear that term a lot in church, armor bearer. But what did armor bearers do? They were devoted to the king. They carried his shield. They carried his weapons in war. They pretty much devoted his life so much so that if the king was wounded or died in battle, they fell on their own sword. Their job was to be knitted to the soul of their leader. Now, the spirit of an armor bearer is also the spirit of Christ because Christ's soul was knit. Anybody ever wonder how he could do what he did? How can you be fully God, fully man, have the pains of man, flesh, emotions, all of that, and still be able to sacrifice for people who hate you? He had to have a soul that was knit to the king, which was God, his father. And it was a level of sacrifice that he did, but their relationship started off in love and it's nothing like the pressures of life to try a relationship when the pressures of life come into a relationship now this was a working relationship but you can apply this to the context of any relationship a marriage boyfriend girlfriend church member whatever you want to say and what happened was if anyone already knows the story as David began to grow in political popularity Saul's insecurities begin to make him jealous. So it's something about even when we examine deliverance, transition, how we all matriculate in life, when it comes to the confounds of relationship, how when one person begins to move, it applies pressure to the heart. 
And then we're talking about a heart of honor. How do we get a heart of honor? Well, it's the same thing. You go through steps and processes. But where we pick this story up here, now the jealousy is already seen. The insecurity is just out there. And in the previous chapter, it says that Saul secretly plotted against him. So, you know, not only do we have an element of surprise because now the one that my soul has been knitted to has betrayed me. The one that my soul has been knitted to, the one that I love, the one that I'd sacrifice for, the one that I would die for, he was or she was my ride or die, has now betrayed me and is plotting my hurt. And so we pick the story up where Saul has been chasing him, and he's been chasing him for about seven years. And if anybody knows about biblical numerology, the number seven is a number of completion. This means that this thing was about to be completely wrapped up, and this is one of the points that God wants you to hear. Point one, this thing is about to be a wrap. It's about to be a wrap. You're feeling the pressure? Because it's about to be a wrap. It's about to be over. That's why everything is coming to try to get you so thrown off. And in most of us, it's trying to be thrown off in, in the emotions, is in the heart. So he, the man has had his wife stripped from him. He's had his title, his position removed. And now he's on the run. And it came to pass when Saul returned from following the Philistines, it was told to him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. How many of you guys know that when you are in this type of battle, it's usually you d- the enemy doesn't have to work very hard to find you? Because usually the enemy has been up close. It's been up close. Uh, prove that in genealogy. Well, the Philistines, which is really ironic, the Philistines come from an Egyptian lineage called from a man named Miserum. And Miserum was a descendant of Ham. Do you guys remember we talking on the morning the call? Ham was the one who was um, Noah's sons who, uh, when he got drunk, <laughs> did not cover him and went and told everybody about his nakedness. So these were the people who were always trying to uncover, always trying to expose, always trying to take um, uh, uh, and make a big deal out of an exploit or a weak situation. So this is a longtime enemy of the children of Israel. So he knew exactly where to find him. And David was in the wilderness. Now, many of us will feel like we are in the wilderness. We are in either, like I say, you don't necessarily have to be completely horrible, but you feel like you're in a place that is just out there. You're not completely in position yet, but you're not all the way back where you used to be. That's where ch- this is where church people call mean time. This is from when God spoke something about you. You're going to be great. You're going to sing. You're going to travel. You're going to be a doctor. You're going to be a lawyer. Da, 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 da. But this is in the middle part where you like, I ain't got no gas money. Can anybody throw me a, 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 a hamburger or something? You know, a, a sister is struggling. It is, it is that meantime where he's in the wilderness. He is literally to his wits end because even before the other chapter, in the last chapter, Saul had had him pent up. But what happened was the Philistines came and he had to leave. And sometimes people will deal with their old enemies and give you a break just to come back. <laughs> just to come back to fool with you again. I know we don't want to hear that because we like, I'm delivered. But the Bible says that even when a spirit goes out of a man, he gives you a little bit of recipe. He comes back with seven times stronger than him to come back and fool with you again. So, flip, flip, flip. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of Israel and went to seek David, and the men was upon the rocks and, rocks and wild goats. Keep going. And he said to, uh, he came to the sheep coats by the way where it was in the cave, and Saul went to cover his feet, and David remained in the cave. And so what, what do we see here? The thing that was pursuing you is now in close quarters with you. Now, remember we talked about pressure earlier, right? Pressure, the greater, the smaller the area or space, the more pressure is applied. So we see that now I've been on the run. 
I got away. Now here you come in my space. I was here first. I was not bothering you. I was not messing with you. But now you have come into my close quarters. And I want to tell you that in this level of warfare and in this place of strategy, the enemy is going to come real, real close. He is going to get literally right in your space because, one, he's not going to strike at a place of strength. The enemy's no fool. He has studied your whole generation, your whole lineage, your whole bloodline. There has been a demon assigned to watch you from birth, your mama, your grandmama, your great, 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 grandma. He knows everything that y'all struggle with. So he's not going to attack you from far. One, he's not going to attack you from afar. That's why betrayal is such a great weapon in the hand of the enemy. That is why division is such a strong weapon in the hand of the enemy, because he understands in order to really wound somebody, it has to come from up close. This is not the snipe. You know what I'm saying? Those of us who like guns and shooting, it's, this is not the, the sniper mode where you're 200 meters away and you're like, oh, I'm going to shoot you in the head. Nobody. No, 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 no. This is I'm up close and personal. So the first thing you're going to have to do is you're going to have to be able, these are steps that are going to help you get to the heart of honor, okay? You're going to first measure your internal and external pressures because not all of your enemies are on the outside, okay? Know where you are. That's all that means. Very simple, very practical today. Know where you are. If you know you can't deal with something today, do not put yourself in a position to be uh, act a, a slam fool. Because me, y'all, I don't know if y'all know, but for me, I will have a tendency to curse. <laughs> that is why I've been on sabbatical. <laughs> not because I was doing other things, but I understand that as a prophet, my mouth is my greatest weapon. And just because I'm not fighting and screwing and getting high and none of that other stuff, my mouth in the wrong way can be deadly. So by the time I get to cursing, I'm two steps from fighting. So I got to, I got to, I got to have a seat. I'm not in a good place, not in a good place. But so y'all pray my strength, praise the Lord. So <laughs> David and his men remained in the sides of the cave, which means they knew how to stay put. So when the enemy comes in close, this is not an, oh, my God, if you don't hear nothing else I say today, this is not the season to have running in your feet. Uh, yes, because that is one of the things I've been, like, trying to figure out how do I escape. Because it seems like it's easier to get a job like in another state, you know, another country. I could easily, I just, people calling me like, there's this director position over here. And I'm just like, yeah. But that, I know that ain't where God called me. You know what I'm saying? So he said, when the enemy came in and he came close, David and his men remain, say remain. Remain. The way you remain is you are knowledgeable about yourself. The only way you can be stable is to have a full understanding about where you are spiritually, emotionally, and mentally. Know your weaknesses and know your strengths. This is the only way that you can appropriately win a battle. If you know yourself and you know your enemy, you have no need to fear because you'll know how to wage a good warfare. Okay? Let's roll to the next scripture. And the men of David said unto him, Behold, David, yo, this is the day that the Lord has said unto you, Behold, I deliver thine enemy into thy hand, which thou mayest do to him as you seem good. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe. Now this is where we have to be very careful. The second step to having a heart of honor is to know timing. Timing. Timing is very important this year. We know timing is important because God even says so in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. He said there are times, there are seasons to everything that is under the heaven, which means there is an appropriate time and there is an inappropriate time to do something. 
because not every warfare strategy requires your movement, as we can see here. But you have to be very careful when it comes to timing because here this is where we also see interchangeably the rules of the prophetic word. Because his homeboys who are with him are saying, hey, look at this situation. This is when God told you I was going to deliver your enemy in your hand and you can do whatever you want to do. But it really was not. It wasn't. Discernment is going to be very paramount. Because just, and the enemy will set it up. This is a warning. The enemy will set it up to where it looks like this is what I've been waiting on. Oh, I'm going to get you, sucker. You dirty. I'm not going to say that. He's going to set it up to where it looks like the perfect time because now. I'm in a perfect position to take advantage of my enemy. Not to mention that my enemy still legally has authority over me. He's the king. He was the Lord's anointed. Though he's seeking my life, though he's seeking to hurt me, though he is legitimately trying to kill me, (laughs) he's still in charge. Now, this speaks to a lot of issues that we have here in the room about authority, fear of authority. And for me, it's always been, that ain't fair. I don't see how you get to do this, and that ain't right, and that hurt my feelings, and I don't like how you said it, and I, I, that's just not fair, God. Because you don't say that part. You'll say it in your head, but you won't tell God, I don't think that's right. I don't think that's right. But getting back on track, timing. Timing is very important. And you must be very careful for the prophetic word because every prophetic word that the Lord gives you, there is a principle of the prophetic, which means if God gives you something, what are you supposed to do with it? Now, this is a good question. It's a good teaching. Huh? Sort of. Sort of. No, almost. You give it back to him. You give it back. Everywhere in the Bible that you see, when God gives something, he requires you to give it back to him. He gives you time. He gives you more money. He requires a percentage of that money, right? He gives you 24 hours in a day. He requires a daily devotion of conversation, whether that's two hours and 40 minutes of your day, whether that's 20 minutes, whether it's 10 minutes, whatever God gives you, he gives you a body. He requires you to present that to him as a reasonable sacrifice, pure and holy. Whatever God gives, he requires for you to give it back. So the same goes with the prophetic word. God had legit spoken this to David, and if you go through First and Second Chronicles, First and Second Samuel, you can see multiple times where the Lord said, I will deliver the enemy into your hands, and you can do whatever you want to do. But in this particular situation, this was not the case. So even, even when It's going to look like the perfect time. You are going to be required to pray. You are going to be required to give God what he spoke back to let him tell you move now or don't do nothing. Sit, sit tight. And this is the problem that we have. We don't, we don't like to sit tight because it requires a discipline because we ready to get you back. You know what I'm saying? We we ready. I've been waiting on this. Yeah, no, that ain't what Jesus is saying today. Hallelujah. So, but he said, but David arose and cut off the skirt of his robe privately. Or privily. This is English, KJV. Privily. So, what that means is he took a little nick at him on the low. Because even in that time, in biblical times, you couldn't even approach a king without the threat of being killed. You know, I don't know if you guys remember, but even in the book of Esther, when she was trying to save the people, if you were not invited to the king in his court and you came unannounced and you said, yo, I want to talk to you real quick, you got killed. So you didn't have the privilege of even getting that close without something bad happening. So on the low, he did 
his little now this is also something we have to watch for because privately means mysteriously undercover nobody could really see it now if y'all know a cave a cave is pretty dark right especially at night it, you know it, they didn't have clap on clap off there was no light bulb so it was pretty much very dark so what he did he was able to see but nobody else was able to see and see this is where all of us slicksters who can say slick stuff and you know you feel like the person ain't gonna figure it out to 10 minutes later you know when they get home be like did she just say this wait a minute that right that that right there that right there I'm going to just say that right there because y'all know what that right there is. Five. And it came to pass afterwards that David's heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's skirt. Now, we think that the determining factor of honor is logic. But the Bible says here that it's not. <laughs> he said his heart smote him. Ephesians 1 and 8. Does anybody know that scripture by heart? I'm going to tell you. Ephesians 1 and 8 says, this is a prayer. It said, and let the eyes of our understanding be enlightened. Now, that word understanding, of course, means understanding. It means intelligent, but it also means the seat of emotion. This is where we can see that the mind and the heart are used interchangeably. They are used interchangeably. So how you think about a situation is also eventually how you will feel about it. So David's heart, oh, what happened here? I have to use my handy dandy. What happened? Thank you. And David's heart smote him. Now. thing was wrong okay but it came to pass as with David's heart smote him and because he had cut off Saul's skirt which means it went back to how he felt about the king and now the eyes of his heart gave him an understanding that this was wrong so here we see the eyes and the heart connected a lot of people always talk about the out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We know that this is a very common phrase we use in church, which is true. However, how you see something is also connected to the emotion. Just like I can say, hey, Kenya, I like your jumpsuit. Girl, that's real, real cute. And somebody else can hear it and make something else of it and be like, oh, she was talking about her. She was trying to be funny. She was So how you see it can depict on how a person can feel a certain way. So it says his heart had cut off Saul's skirt. Flip to the next one. And he said unto his men, the Lord forbid that I should go and do this thing to my master, Jesus. <laughs> mm, yes. The Lord forbid that I should go and do this thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. Now, what's very ironic about this, he was anointed first, but was not David anointed as well? Did not the prophet go to him and pour the oil upon his head and say that he was going to be the next king of Israel? But though I'm anointed, you were anointed before me position we see position now the third step of you being able to have a heart and honor is to mind your influence mind your influence what does mind your influence mean that means that God has given every single one of us a sphere of influence whether it's two people, whether it's ten people, you have the ability to sway someone's opinion in the right way or the wrong way. Even if, you know, they are meaning you well. Because, again, his homeboys was like, this was the word of the Lord. This is what was going on. This is it. Dude, take advantage. But he's saying, <laughs> he's saying Lord forbid that I should do this to the person who's over me. Shut your 
mouth. I'm not going to do this. Are you crazy? This is the Lord's anointed. Do you think it's wise of me to stretch my hand forth? Seeing, seeing, say seeing, 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 seeing. You Come on, say that again. I want you to get it in your spirit. Seeing, he is the anointed of the Lord. Right now, this is the person who is anointed for the position. How does he see it? Because his heart allows him to see it. Not his eyes, not his environment, but his heart, the seat of his understanding that only the Lord God have given him, according to Ephesians 1 and 8. The eyes of his understanding. This denotes when you have a good understanding because real maturity, now this is, this is going to be for those of us who want to wear our big girl panties and our big boy boxers. Because you don't honor a person based upon the person. You honor a person based upon position. Even God himself, when he dealt with people who were not honorable, who we would consider not honorable, take, for example, Gideon. Gideon was a coward, and he was scared, and he was hiding during the time book of Judges and see it but he was hiding and he was hiding his food because he was scared that the Philistines or one of them ice was gonna come and get his food but when God began when he sent the angel to herald a message to him he didn't say Gideon you coward what are you doing now there you need to get up he said great and mighty man of valor now this is God the all-seeing God the all-knowing God the all-powerful the one perfect God. This is how he is addressing somebody. Because real honor and uh, the culture of honor, I don't know if anybody's read that book. I know you probably have heard of it by Danny Silk. I would uh, recommend that highly. But a real culture of honor is a culture of kingdom. And one of our jobs, according to New Testament scripture, if a brother has fallen and flipped into a fault, we're supposed to restore him in a spirit of what? Meekness. So our job as members and bodies of Christ is not to strip away somebody's honor. It's really to restore it. So even in this sense where we see with David and Saul, Saul was acting like a slam fool. And anybody who really knew what was going on knew he was acting like an insecure fool. However, even in David in his position, his posture was to restore honor to the office that this man had look at how he talked to his homeboys which goes back to my point mind your influence be very mindful of your influence go ahead and flip it to the next scripture so David stayed his servants with these words and suffered them not to rise against Saul but Saul rose up out of the cave and went out verse 8 and David arose and went out of the cave and cried at the Saul, saying, My Lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped his face to the earth and bowed himself. Step four of having an honorable heart. Baby, you're going to have to get low. Okay, no. Okay. No. No. Um, <laughs> you're going to have to get low. And... Is that going to be painful? Absolutely. Because you're going to feel very justified, especially if what the person really did was foul. You're going to really feel like, you know what? I legally have a right to do this. Even when it comes to humanity, if somebody is trying to kill you, you not thinking, uh, let me just bow myself to the ground, O oh Holy One of Israel. No, you're trying to punch a ninja in the face. But look at how he addressed him. He addressed him according to who he was supposed to be. My Lord, the king, when Saul looked behind him, David stood his face in the ground and bowed himself. He got as low as he possibly could. Because the true reality is, is the reason Saul was after him is because he was insecure, but that insecurity was because he was threatened. How can you position yourself, even in places with people who don't see you in the best light, so where you don't look like you're even a threat? 
And it doesn't take away from who you are as a person. He bowed himself to the ground, nine. And David said, wherefore thou men's words saying, behold, David, the seek thy hurt. This is a bunch of rumor, gossip that's going on, chatter. And wherever usually there is division, it's a whole lot of words. It's a whole lot of chatter, a whole lot of a running of the mouth that don't need to be a running. Verse 10. Behold, this day thine eyes, see how we keep going back to sight? Because this is about how you view stuff. Behind, behold, this day thine eyes have seen now that the Lord had delivered me into, pretty much, I'm sorry, I'm reading NIV, delivered thee today into my hand, into the cave, and some bade me to kill you, but my eye, again, my eye, spared thee how I saw you how I looked at who you really were how I remembered you when I first came into your presence and we loved one another my eye has spared you and I said I will not pull forth my hand against my Lord for he is the Lord's anointed what I want you to take from that my eye my eye has spared you, not how I felt about you, not what I feel justified to do to you, but how the eyes of my heart really see you. And I don't know about y'all, but with me, even when it comes to love, for some reason, I don't know, for some reason, love and anger run very close. Because, you know, this is the old school saying, it's a thin line. It's a very thin line between love and hate. And usually both of those two are very, very, very close together. But what keeps relationships intact, what keeps unity in a body together is really not everything else, but it is how you see the person with your heart. How I see you is what spared you. Other people told me to kill you. Other people reminded me that God himself said that I was anointed, that God himself said that he would give the enemy, my enemy into my hand. And in this moment, right now, you really are my enemy. However, my eye has spared thee and I will not put my hand against my Lord, against the person who is in authority over me. He is the Lord's anointed. Verse 11. Moreover, my father, this is tender love right here. This ain't uh, my leader, my Lord. He said my father. Now he says my father, not because David didn't have a father. We all know David had a father who was Jesse. But he said my father because he married into the family. Saul was his father-in-law. He married his daughter. He went to the, the, the baby christenings. You know, he, he went to the funerals. He did all this stuff. They kicked it for a long time before it turned sour. Because David went through processes of popularity. He went through many battles before people began to sing. Saul is saying his thousands and David his ten thousands. So they went through a lot of stuff to get to that point. Before he, you know, he was saying, you my father. My father, see, we keep going back to this word, see, see, yay, see the skirt of thy robe in my hand. For I cut it off, the skirt of thy robe, and kill thee not. Know thou, and what? See, so this is just not how you see. The way you position yourself will allow someone else to see. See that there is neither evil nor transgression in my hand. I'm free of this. Here's my receipt. The skirt, I could have done what I wanted to, but I didn't. So now you get to see that I'm really not your enemy. Because let's, let's be real. Can we have a real moment? Most of us in here who have had odds with each other is because we thought, the other person was really not on our side. 
we thought that we was the other person's enemy or vice versa. And many, many encounters that probably was true. Whether it was underlying a spirit of jealousy, insecurity, competition, whichever way you want to put it, whatever bow you want to put it in and wrap it up in, you saw that person as your either oppressor, uh, adversary, enemy, whatever way you want to call it. Look now how I've positioned myself. So you can see there's either evil, which is bad intent, nor transgression, which is big. Because transgression is what? A habitual line stepper. A person who is always saying, this is the line, this is where we're supposed to be, and a person who's always crossing over the line. That's what transgression means. That's what God, even that's what God calls it. When he talks about iniquities and transgressions, he's saying, I put a boundary here for your own safety, for your protection. You keep going over the line. So you can see I don't have ill intent towards you, and I'm not consistently trying to cross lines with you. You can see that it is, it's been in within my hands to do it. I have not sinned against thee, even though you hunt my soul to take it, even though you purposely try to kill me. You purposely try to break my heart. You purposely try to embarrass me. You purposely try to shame me. You purposely try to put an end to my reputation. You purposely try to talk to about me to other people. All of this stuff, because all of this was what was going on. Twelve. The Lord judged between me and thee, and the Lord avenged me of thee. But, say but. God is calling you to be the exception. That is what but means. It means no matter what was said before this point right here, it wipes it out. But my hand shall not come upon thee. What is the last step to having a heart of honor? <laughs> you let God be judge. Because when we are vengeful, when we strike out, when we do things that are dishonorable to those who are in positions of leadership, and I'm not just talking about church leadership. This ain't about church stuff. This is applicable in every place of your life. I'm talking about your boss at work. I'm talking about Lord help our president and the members of his cabinet. I'm talking about making sure that you allow God to be the one who repays. Because when we dishonor one another, we step over lines, we step over boundaries, we take matters into our own hands. This is what we do. It may be in subtle ways, it may be in bold ways, but at the end, we have taken God off of his throne and said, Jesus, you step back, I got this one. When you have no right, no authority, you're not powerful enough, you're not wise enough to see the beginning to the end of something. Because you don't even know that this person, and it's usually the enemy will set it up that the person that you have the most conflict with is going to be your greatest ally in the end. I'm telling you, it is a trick of the enemy. The person that usually irritates you the most is the one you're called to. The one you're called to pray for. The one you're called to assist. The one you're called to train. The one you're called to impart to. This is going to be your greatest ally. Because can you imagine the scenario of this? If Saul would have put David to his side and made him a partner. David's kingdom, David's kingdom reigned for 40 years, which is the longest stretch of rulership in Israel's history. But imagine how glorious the kingdom could have been if Saul and David worked together. He said, but my hand shall not be upon thee. Let's go 13 for good measure. Can you get it? And saith the proverb of the ancients, this is that wisdom, wisdom is a strategy, wisdom is a defense. And saith the problem of the ancients, wickedness proceeded from the wicked, but my hand shall not 
be upon thee. This means that you have to make a decision that no matter what nobody else does, you will not get and put your hand in the mix of it. Because the Lord is judge. And when everybody has the mindset that God and God alone has the right to judge a decision and to impede or in place punishment or blessing, then everybody stays in their rightful place. Nobody steps out of line. Nobody becomes disrespectful. Nobody becomes vengeful. No, Because you already know God's going to handle this. Now, what happened in the end? Of course, Saul dies. He says, you know what? You are more honorable than me. He ends up dying. And further on in 2 Samuel, we see, I think it's 2 Samuel chapter 5. Not sure of the verse. But we see David, who now still has to face the longtime enemy of the Philistines, asking God, should he go to war? And he ends up, the Lord tells him to go. And he ends up naming this place Bel Perazim, which means my God has broken through like the crashing of many waters. The pressure of the water and the weight of victory only comes from a position of honor. Only comes from a position of honor. You will never have substantial victory. And when I say substantial victory, I mean substantial victory. Because you can have the temporary victory where it looks like, hey, I look good in the moment. But substantial victory means it's long-lasting. It's stable. God is trying to allow the weight of his glory. And he's trying to use honor as a strategy to perfectly position you for a place of stability and long-term success. There was no other king in the kingdom of Israel and Judah combined that had the longest stretch of reign in day, as David did. Matter of fact, so much so that they called the years that David reigned the golden years of Israel, and it was never, ever like that again. Not even with Solomon, who was the wisest king, who was his, uh, not predecessor, successor. You can have wisdom, and wisdom is a defense, but wisdom even without honor does not bring stability. Because the weight of God's glory will give you stability. It'll put you in position. But remember when I talked about going through layers and elevation? For every layer, God has to give you a level of force behind you because it takes that force to break through. Because the enemy is going to put up barriers around you. Because anytime God speaks something, the enemy's job is to be your adversary. He is your resistance. And every time you have resistance, you need a greater pressure and weight behind you to push you through. How God is doing that in this hour is honor. Now, last fun fact, and I'm done because it's like three minutes to four. The other fun thing about the Hebrew language is that the Hebrew language in the alphabet also translates into numbers. It's called the gamantra. And it's kind of like a code that the Hebrew, ancient Hebrew used as a cipher. So there is a symbol and a number assigned to every letter of the alphabet. And when you look at the word kabod, that number is 13. And no, I'm sorry, when you look at the word love, the number is 13. And the Hebrew word is ahava. When you look up kabod, kabod is 26. So 13 times 2 is what? 26. Which means when the word said to honor your mother and father so your days will be long. Or to honor those and pray for those who have rule over you. What that literally translates to in the gamatra is not just love them, a double portion of love. Because it is only love that allows the heart to see appropriately. This is why we are called to be great. I know we're COP New Jersey now, or Asbury, but we started off as greater love because love was supposed to be the foundation that gave us the power and the pressure to break through 
different areas in the community. Our love is not just supposed to be good. It's supposed to be great. It's supposed to literally be a double portion of what normal love is supposed to be. And love works through every facet of the kingdom. Faith, work it by love. Honor is the on love is the only way you're going to be able to honor. Because love gives you a clear lens in the heart to see, 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 see. We saw that word so many times. See a person appropriately, even when they behave unhonorably. So I want to encourage you guys today as we wrap up. Do you need an envelope? Please raise your hand. The usher will serve you. But I want to encourage you as we wrap up to go and do some homework. Pray and ask God where your heart is not in the right position, where your heart cannot see an individual the way the Lord sees them. This is why we're supposed to pray for our enemy. This is why the scripture says we love our enemy. But in the New Testament, it says we're supposed to give double honor to those who serve in the house of God. If you love your enemy, how much more are you supposed to love people who are working with you? It's hard work. Yes. Anytime you surrender, anytime you submit, it's hard. It is not fun. But confrontation doesn't necessarily have to be nasty. See, this is where we have it mixed up. You can confront somebody and still have a confrontation and it be honorable. Because I see you. I see you. That's one thing we love about God so much because he sees us. Above all the crazy, above me acting stupid, making wrong choices, cussing people out. <laughs> he still sees me. And what he sees is my heart. He sees that my heart is to do right. He sees my heart is to love, even if my behavior does not always match it. So I want to invite you and challenge you this week. For those of you who uh, have particular people that you struggle with, look through the eyes and the lens of love. It's going to allow you to see who that person really is, and that love is going to help you address them better. It's going to help you to honor them. I'm not saying it's going to be an immediate fix because it takes some work. It takes work. This is the year of work. This is the year of great blessing, but it's the year of work, honey going to take great work but at the end of it is going to be a good result amen